in a series right now on Jesus, uh, talking about a reason to believe. We're, we're trying to, to unwrap a little bit, and I'm trying to stimulate your thinking and your study. Obviously, in 30 or 40 minutes of me talking on Saturday morning, we're not going to cover the topic of Jesus. <laughs> But I can tell you that if you get intentional with studying about this man who lived 2,000 years ago on this planet, walked uh, among human beings and talked with us as one of us, and he lives today, if you you get intentional about really discovering him, you're going to find more more material than you'll ever be able to get through in your entire lifetime. So uh, there's a couple of books that I want to recommend. I mentioned one before. Uh, It's by a a man, a New Testament scholar by the name of N.T. Wright. He's an English English pastor, actually, but he's he's renowned as a New Testament scholar. And he wrote a book called Simply Jesus. You can get it uh, probably at Barnes & Nobles. You can get it online at Amazon, or you can download it as a Kindle book. It's really a book that helps you see Jesus in the context of the whole human experience and all the the factors that led to uh, his death and his resurrection. Then another book that was shared with me this week by Alan and Debbie uh, is a book by Bill O'Reilly. When I heard this, I couldn't believe it. Bill O'Reilly writing a book about Jesus? (laughs) But he did, and it's an awesome book. It really goes more towards the actual political, social uh, climate of the times, and it's called Killing Jesus. And he really goes into depth about what was going on in the Roman Empire, in the Jewish uh, culture, and in the life of Christ that led to his death, and, and really details what that was about. So I just, I don't usually recommend books, but both of these will, will stimulate your thinking. They will create a new picture for you of who Jesus really was. So this weekend is a a pretty significant weekend for those of us that were alive and uh, at least semi-conscious back in 50 years ago, right? Where were you on the day John F. Kennedy was shot? Many of you here were not born yet, so we'll let you off. But, But that question is a question that millions of people are asking each other this weekend. Those of us here today who were alive on that fateful day, almost without exception, there might be a few exceptions, but everyone that I've talked to, we can remember details about that day like we can remember no other day in our lives. I was in the seventh grade at Riverside Seventh-day Adventist Elementary School. Our principal's name was Mr. Scheidemann. That was a name. Um, And he must have gotten a phone call because I remember that he put the radio on for the whole school and we began to listen to the newscasts and uh, and these unbelievable events that were taking place. And now we were a Seventh-day Adventist school and, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, particularly my dad, maybe I should filter it that way, were not excited about having a Roman Catholic in the White House. You understand what I'm saying? But that day was a day that transcended all of that. It was a tragic and a traumatic day. When the news came that the president had, had died, we all assembled at the flagpole and we watched as the stars and stripes were lowered to half-mast. I vaguely remember one of the teachers saying a prayer and then we were dismissed early because the principal had called our parents or the ones that were close by, like myself and brothers and sisters, we walked home. JFK, John F. Kennedy, like leaders before and leaders since, he was seen as a sort of Messiah for the new decade. He was young, he was intelligent, he was visionary, he captured the minds and the hearts of Americans like no one had for some time. Political and social hopes ran high in the nation. They said it was Camelot all over again. If you've read stories of King Arthur and Camelot, you know know what that means. But just when everything was beginning to look so good, so rosy, JFK was cut down. Since his death, we've learned a lot of things about the man and learned that the Camelot of the Kennedy years was a pretty flawed and faulty thing. And 
JFK was a very flawed and faulty man. And yet we still yearn for what we wished for then and what people wish for now, we yearn for a deliverer, for a Messiah. A Messiah. Now that word Messiah actually comes from a, a Hebrew word, I believe, that, that means uh, the deliverer. And the, the idea of the Messiah coming to deliver his people is, is found throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, uh, the word kind of becomes Christ, the Christ, the anointed one. That's from a Greek word. And then we get the personal touch with Jesus. You will call his name Jesus, the angel said to Joseph and Mary, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, the Savior. It all started back in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.15. You know, when God went in the garden looking for Adam and Eve, he, he knew where they were, but it's almost like they were, they were infants in adult bodies. Where are you, Adam and Eve? I know you're hiding, you know. And they come out, and, uh, and that, that awful thing happens. They're confronted with the fact that they disobeyed. And so God, God pronounces his judgment. And one of the most important, one of the most important prophecies in all of the Bible, it's the beginning of this whole messianic stream, comes right here in Genesis 3:15. You know, he didn't start with Eve. He didn't start with Adam. <laughs> and uh, Adam, of course, blamed his wife and his wife blamed the snake. There's always somebody to blame. But he started with the snake. I will make you and the woman enemies to each other. Now, I've known some women that don't mind snakes, but generally women don't like snakes. My mother didn't like it when our pet snake got out of the cage and one day crawled up out of the shower while she was in it. That wasn't. But, but this goes beyond, uh, you know, just female hatred of reptiles. I will make you and the woman enemies with each other. Your descendants and her descendants will be enemies. One of her descendants will crush your head and you will bite his heel. That becomes the beginning of the messianic hope for the people of God. And so through the history of the Israelites, from, from Adam and Eve all the way down, this hope is kept alive. And there's a cycle that takes place within Israel within the people of God, in fact, within the whole human race. And that cycle is this. Um, we're tempted. It happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's, it happened with the nation after God chose them as a nation, Israel. It happened, it's happened with us in our lives. It's happened with our church uh, as a whole. It's happened with the whole human race. We're tempted. We give in to temptation Sin comes along, we fall, we apostatize from God, then we get into trouble because we're apart from God, and the trouble comes. And for the nation of Israel, it was often the foreign nations that came and invaded them and, and, and uh, gave them all kinds of grief and tribulation. And in the midst of our trouble, we cry out to God, Lord, where are you? We're sorry. And we say all kinds of things to God, and he already knows, like he did Adam and Eve when he came to the garden. And so then, restoration comes, forgiveness comes, restoration comes, and we're back to where we started, getting ready to do it, do it all over again. Over the centuries, because Israel as a nation, Israel as the people of God had gone through this cycle so many times, uh, they, they kind of lost sight of what God was trying to tell them in the beginning, not through the efforts of Pharaoh and what happened with Pharaoh coming out of Egypt, not through what the Philistines did to uh, the Israelites after they got to the promised land, not the Assyrians, not the Babylons, not the Persians, nobody that brought them down and, and then they found restoration and forgiveness in God. They never learned, but they kept that hope alive. They kept thinking, okay, someone's going to come and deliver us. And God kept sending people to deliver them. He sent the prophets to tell them what they were doing. They killed the prophets. They threw them in sewers. They persecuted them. 
They ran them out of town. They ran them out of the country. He sent messengers. He sent prophets. He sent teachers, but they wouldn't listen. Then they would get into trouble and they would say, Lord, help us. One of the kings, Josiah, discovers the law in the temple one day. It's all covered with dust. He discovers the scrolls. He has someone read it to him and he's struck in his heart. He repents and he repent. He leads the whole nation into repenting before God. Great revival. And then before long, they're down deeper away from God than ever before. And through all of these cycles, they didn't lose the idea of Messiah, but what they lost was the idea of God, who God really is. When Jesus came on the scene, the most recent experience that the the, uh, Jewish people had had was with the Maccabean revolts. Now, growing up in Adventist, because of our theology in Daniel, we didn't really learn much about this guy Antiochus Epiphanes. But he was horrible. He, he, he came in to Jerusalem. He was in charge of Jerusalem. And he decided that the only way to take care of the, this Jewish nuisance was to eliminate all forms of their religion and to make them into like everyone else. So he sacrificed, I believe, sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. It was so offensive that they rose up against him, and so there was this, these years of revolt that culminated in wars. And so the Maccabees became famous for people who would stand up. They were, like, uh, they were Messiah-like figures. And so in the consciousness of the people in Jesus' day, they remembered that. And they remembered Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, and they remembered... Pharaoh, they remembered all the times that they had been brought out of slavery, but what they forgot is what got them there in the first place. Except they didn't worship idols. And so when Jesus came, there was an expectation of what Messiah really was going to be. And and we see throughout his ministry, in fact, throughout his entire life, sometimes we get the picture that Jesus came to earth. He, you know, we, we have these sweet, soft, lovely Pictures of Jesus being born. He was born in a dirty, stinking, filthy, disease-ridden barn. Jesus wasn't born on a Christmas card. He wasn't, he, he, he didn't have a contract with Hallmark, you know. From the moment of his birth, in fact, before he was born, Jesus created controversy. Jesus brought trouble to the world, or at least that's the way the world saw it. And so throughout his life, he was always coming up against the expectation. But Jesus, I don't know at what point the lights came on, maybe when he was 12 at the temple that time, asking all the questions and answering the questions. But at some point in his life, he realized who he was. And from that point, everything he did was intentional. Everything he did was following the plan that he that was being opened for him by his father. And so the expectation, Zechariah 9.9, is is a good illustration of the expectation they have. This was in the Old Testament scriptures. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, they, you know, they kind of skip over the lowly and riding. You know, the lowly part is that he's riding on a donkey instead of a horse, but he's a glorious, victorious king. And he's coming to deliver us, to throw off the yoke of the Romans. We, we celebrate people today who go to battle and win physical battles, don't we? Heroes, we call them. They were looking for a hero who would fight like Judah Maccabeus did. Even if they died, that's okay. You know, we got to fight, we got to rise up, we got to claim our right to where God, what God originally had for us. <laughs> so when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on that Sunday before he died, he, he, he comes over the Mount of Olives and he stops looking over this beautiful city. And, and everybody, the whole world, it seems, is, is proclaiming him. They're expecting him to go into the temple, to cleanse the temple. That's something that happened on a repeated basis as well. So that, that's what the Messiah does. He asserts the throne of, of the, the Jewish people. He asserts the priesthood of the temple, and he takes control and cleans the Romans out, and, and the Israelites are back on top again. 
But Jesus stops. He stops. And he looks over the city, and he thinks about his people, and he thinks about their misguided expectations, their misunderstanding of of what God is up to in this world, and he begins to weep uncontrollably. Can you imagine if a presidential candidate who had just been elected president stood up at the podium and everybody's cheering and going crazy and they break down weeping? I mean, they, you know, the white coat, coated guys would take him off the stage and take him to the BMC. That's the behavioral medicine center in Loma Linda. We, we can't handle that. Jesus breaks down in uncontrollable sobs as he looks over Jerusalem and he realizes what is before him. But he knows he has to go there. He knows that it is, it is not only his fate, it is his destiny. It is his purpose to go to the cross. Nobody else understands that. Nobody else wants to hear it. Nobody else really realizes what's going on. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament picture of Messiah. I thought of three ways that he did that. And, and we, we look back, we look back on, on the Old Testament and we say, well, how could they miss this? Well, folks, you have hindsight. Come on. That's like Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking, right? Or Tuesday. When is it? Sunday night when they have the big football game? All right. I mean, come on. That's not fair. Do you know that if Jesus were to come as one of us, contemporary, living in the 21st century, looks like us, dresses like us, if he were to come today, we would have the same attitudes that they had back then. Just take a little different form. We'd kill him. We couldn't take it. And I say we, you know, hopefully some of us here would embrace Christ, but we wouldn't understand him. This world would put him to death as surely today as they did 2,000 years ago. Wouldn't be a bit different because we don't understand God. And he keeps trying to tell us. But Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament picture of Messiah as three, in three aspects. First of all, he, he did so as a servant. He did so as a servant. And we, we talk a lot in church about serving and service. But I wonder if we really, really honestly get it. Here is my servant. This was one of the prophecies, Isaiah 42. Here is my servant, the one I support. He's the one I chose, and I am pleased with him. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring justice to all nations. He will not cry out or yell or speak loudly in the streets. He will not break a crushed blade of grass or even put out, or put out even a weak flame. He will truly bring justice. Now listen, we don't expect our heroes to be like this. Nobody in Jesus' day expected the Messiah to be like this. They wanted justice, yes, but the idea that he would come and not cry out or yell or speak loudly, as it says. Well, all the false messiahs, we call them false messiahs now, all the people who rose up to do something great for Israel, they were always trying to gather a crowd together to get people to see it their way. But Jesus just came and he served. He wouldn't even break a crushed blade of grass, meaning he he wouldn't... suffocate or suppress the most tender soul or spirit. They didn't understand the Messiah in that way. Isaiah 53 says, My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He didn't have handlers. You know what I'm saying? Jesus didn't have people running around managing his PR for him. He didn't have an image. He didn't have the iMag where they made sure that he he was in the right light. I mean, I don't know what they used for makeup in Jesus' day, but the Romans were vain. So you know the Jews picked some of that up. Jesus wasn't any of that. He He just didn't play that game at all. It wasn't about image. It was about heart. It was about truth. He was a servant. Everything about Jesus was serving. It was was giving. It was selfless. He said, I've not come here to be served. I've come to serve. We mentioned last night that the last night before he died, he gathers his disciples together. They're sitting in a room, 
and uh, there's supposed to be a servant there, someone who will wash their feet. That was a common practice in the day to freshen things up when they had a big feast. No one was there. The disciples weren't about to lower themselves to do that kind of work. They were the disciples. We are the gang, we, not the gang, we are the, the brothers of Jesus, you know. We're the, we're the ones, sometimes I wonder, maybe they thought of themselves as a gang, I don't know. But, but we're the ones who've been going out and healing and preaching, and they, they had a pretty, pretty big idea of themselves. Two of them, James and John, in fact, went to Jesus and said, you know, when you, when you establish your kingdom, when you finally do ascend the throne in a few days, that's kind of the implication, let us sit, one on the right hand and one on the left. They even got their mother in, the, in on the act. That's where their heads were at. And Jesus gets a basin, takes off his outer robe, kneels down on the floor and starts washing their filthy feet. And they are, they are shocked. Now, because we've done that in church, we, we don't understand, but they were shocked. Some of them were absolutely offended. Peter was one of them. Jesus said, look, you call me master. I'm your master, okay? And what do you see me doing here? I'm serving you. If I, the master, serve you on the lowest menial task that could be in a household, what do you think I expect you to do? What do you think I expect you to do when your church thinks about reaching out into the community? Do you think maybe you, you might want to go out and find some hungry people and give them food, as we did last Sabbath? Came up to one door and a lady came out crying. She said, so glad you're here. We didn't have any food. We didn't know where we were going to get more food. She said, our, our finances are in just such a mess. And so we gave her a couple of bags of food and, and I asked her if she'd like a prayer. We prayed together. You know, other places we went, family with little children, they needed food. You think maybe when, when we have agencies and we have people in our community who are trying to help the homeless and trying to help uh, abused uh, wives and, and mothers, that maybe Jesus might want us to lend a hand like, like Maggie was sharing with us, Mercy House. So what if they don't have the SDA, you know, imprimatur on it? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You think that maybe when we hear about this horrible tragedy in the Philippines, it's so far away. Oh, but wait, there are people here in our church who have relatives over there. That, that it, would, it would be something Christ would want us to do to open our pocketbooks and maybe go without uh, a Starbucks. I hate to say that, but... You know, so that somebody else could have just water to drink. Servant. Jesus in the Old Testament is a servant, and they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Then Jesus, the second picture of Jesus that we find in the prophecies, but they, they, they just kind of pushed it aside, was that he's a substitute. He's a substitute I don't, I don't remember reading anything in the Bible where it says they sacrificed an animal at the gates of Eden, although that's in some of the religious literature that we read, and maybe that was true. But the first, the first thing that I remember was Noah, you know, when the ark lands, and, they, and God says, I want you to sacrifice. But the, the one that really kept, captures our attention is this one where God says, I want you to take your son up in the hill, and I want you to sacrifice it. And obviously, Abraham was used to animal sacrifices. And he said, Lord, I, how can I do that? God said, do it, Abraham. And so he goes up there. And Isaac, he's old enough to know what's what and what's not. And he says, Father, we have the coals and the wood, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? My son, Abraham answered, God will provide the lamb. Abraham really didn't realize that he was making a prophecy there. One version says God will provide himself a lamb. Abraham thought it was going to be Isaac. It wasn't. God provided a lamb, a substitute for his son. He said, I'm going to give you a lamb so your son doesn't have to die. 
and you'll still be within the bounds of, my, of, of obedience to me. A substitute, a, a, an innocent, spotless victim that takes on the sins of the people. That was part of, of the community, part of the culture, part of the religion of, of the Hebrew people. Leviticus 1.4, as they're traveling, they're out on the beginning of their desert journey on their way to the promised land, they get, they get this body of law that comes down to them. Laws about cleanliness, laws about food, laws about how they sacrifice and don't sacrifice. And one of the laws, one of the first laws is Leviticus 1.4, talking about bringing a spotless lamb to, to this, the altar. You shall put your hand on its head and it will be accepted as a sacrifice to take away your sins. See, the, the idea of substitution was there all along. They just thought maybe it was somebody else. Maybe God would bring a really nice person along and they would die for the people. But the idea that the Messiah would be the one who would lay down his life, it's there. They just didn't see it. Like we don't see so many things in our lives. And finally, uh, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament picture of the Messiah as a sufferer. He suffered. He came as the Messiah. He came to deliver, to deliver us, but he suffered like no one had ever suffered before and like no one ever will suffer again. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. He was despised and rejected by man. How can he be the Messiah if he's rejected by mankind? Do you think Jesus knew when he went to the cross that that was going to happen? You read Isaiah 53, didn't he? He absolutely knew what was going to happen. He had no question about it. When Peter said to him that day, he says, who do, who, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, okay, we're going to get ready. We're going to go to Jerusalem and there I have to die. Peter said, oh no, Lord, you can never do that. Peter didn't get it. Judas didn't get it. Matthew didn't get it. They tried to keep him from his destiny, from his purpose that God sent him for. Because if Jesus didn't go through with that, we wouldn't even be here today. We would have no chance. Over and over again in the Old Testament, we find prophecies where, where they depict the suffering of the Messiah, and yet they missed it. The enemy, Psalm 22, the enemy, this gang of evil men, circles me like a pack of dogs. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count every bone in my body. See these men of evil gloat and stare. They divide my clothes among themselves by a toss of the dice, and that's exactly what happened. I've been on the pavement where Jesus stood when he was before Pilate. And in that pavement, they would carve in the, in the stone pavements, they would carve like game boards where they would play games of chance. They rolled the dice as Jesus stood there waiting. Prophesied in Psalm 22. Zechariah 12, where they got the idea of the king coming triumphantly. Zechariah also says this, they will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. For a firstborn son. I, I believe that that Jesus is someone much greater, much more important, much more essential than any of us have a clue about. And, and, I, and I realize that, that what God is trying to do is get us to go to where that place is between heaven and earth. There's only one way we can do that. It, it's through prayer. There's only one way that we can, we can, by faith, reach out to that other dimension. Not billions of light years away, but right here. God said, wherever we gather in the name of Jesus, he's present with us. Well, I, I can't see and, and I can't 
tangibly touch God like we want to because we're, we're so physical, but God is here nonetheless. But how do we access that divine realm? How do we open up to Christ who is, who is the suffering servant and substitute? It's, it's through prayer. I know that every one of you here have needs in your life. I know that every one of you have challenges. I, I've asked Margaret Baldwin if she would, as one of the mothers of our church, pray for us this morning. Diane and I call her and Bob the matriarch and patriarch of our church. They have such a wealth of experience uh, that, that God's taken them through so many things, good and bad. I mean, they have... they. Talk about the original Celebrate Recovery. These folks, uh, you know, they're not afraid and not ashamed to share with you their mistakes and how God worked with them and how God's grace was in their life. But I just wonder, Margaret, if you'd come and, and lead us in prayer, and then we'll conclude. Lord, you've told us in the Bible that you inhabit our praises. You live in our praises And we have been praising you, Lord, today in this church and telling you what is deep in our hearts, that you are a glorious God. So we know that you have inhabited us today. You are living right now in each of our hearts. Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, come and sit beside each one here. Help them to know that you are their companion, that you are their guide, that you are their comforter. And even though you are the God in the heaven above, you can reach out and you can hold each person's hand. You can touch their lives right now. Not only can you comfort us, you can inspire us. You can challenge us. You can give us invigorating joy and life and energy to do whatever it is you want us to do as servants to others. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In this special season, this special time of year, we want to praise you. We want to honor you with every part of our bodies and minds and voices. And anyone else here today who wants to say, praise you, Lord, do it now. Praise "Praise you, Lord. We want you to inhabit us. Praise you, Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. We thank you for who you are and what you are. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You have inhabited our hearts. We are here to serve you, and we are going to continue to praise you all our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus suffered because it was his plan, not because he fell into an accidental dispute with the Jewish leaders. What was going on had so little to do with the Romans and the Jewish religious guides of the day, and it had everything to do with the human race. 1 Peter 3.18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sins. It was His plan. It was His intention. It was His purpose. He suffered once for sins. That means your sin and my sin. Because He saw us living here in 2013. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. That was the whole point of it. To bring us to God. (laughs) Why are we content to live in this world the way we do? When we could be with God. When we can be, be connected with the eternal mind and heart and glory of, of God, of the universe. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. Where were you when Jesus of Nazareth was lifted up and pierced through with a spear? The old spiritual asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? 
None of us were born. And when we think of Kennedy's death, some of us were. But when Jesus died, none of us were. But we were all there. The real Messiah hung on a cross, not the victim of an assassin's bullet, but the willing sacrifice for the sins of the whole human race, past, present, and future. I was there. So were you. Did Jesus feel the pain of your sins and the nails that pierced his hands and feet, or the lacerations of the whips, or the bruises from beatings, or the gashes of the thorns? Did he suffer from my transgressions when the rough wooden cross cut into him? Or through the extreme thirst of his last moments? Or by the abandonment of his friends when he needed them most? The prophet Isaiah says, you and I were there. He says, this is my paraphrase, he was wounded for our disobedience. He was bruised for our wrongdoing. He paid for our peace by taking our punishment. And with his wounds, we are healed. Jesus, the true Messiah, entered the domain of death, not by defeat, but through victory. He stormed the gates of death in order to destroy death so we could all live. His sojourn was no fairy tale Camelot, but the establishment of a real kingdom that will never end. It continues to this day. God's kingdom is real. It's here. It's now. God wants to open our minds and our hearts to that reality. We do not look back on that fateful day of the crucifixion of Jesus with nostalgia and with sadness as we do with other events, but with joy and thanksgiving. That's what this meal is all about. We're going to eat in a few moments. It's what our celebrations, our national holiday is this coming week. We, we look back with joy and thanksgiving because that day was not the end of his life. It was the beginning of our life. Because through the horror of Calvary, he gave us real and lasting hope. I remember very well that Friday 50 years ago when the shots rang out in Daly Plaza. But not more clearly then as a believer, I remember that Friday 2,000 years ago when my Messiah Jesus took the bullet of guilt intended for me so that I could know his full and free forgiveness. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. With his stripes, the Bible says, we are healed. 